Can I have a quote here from the late author Philip Roth? And quote is, the road to hell is paved with works in progress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's worse than good intentions, right? Um, and was that a question? <laughs> like, it's a statement and, and a question, I guess, in that do you have any ideas on that? I know it's, it's kind of a, a thing I'm just throwing out here. but Well, I think unfinished works are um, the, the kind of characteristic debris of the writer's life. Um, of any visionary's life. I mean, the, the discards that Leonardo da Vinci had in his studio were prodigious. And um, you, you just have a lot of ideas and you can't do them all. And one of the methods that I've developed over the years is to actually set aside a new idea and give it a two week rest and, and check in with it in two weeks to see whether you even remember the idea uh, and, and the key to doing that as a writer is not to write it down. See, it's like a basic rule that I have is that if you have an idea and as a writer, your immediate goal is to write it down, get it down, because that's what writers do. If you can train your brain not to do that, you're going to have much better product in the long run because you're not writing every single thing down, including every bad thing. So by not writing it down, when you revisit it two weeks from now. Uh, if you don't remember it, that's great. That means one lousy idea went away, as opposed to trying to do something with every single idea that you have. So I think that's part of what creative people learn is how to manage their own minds. Uh, and, and because I was an accountant's son, I long ago analyzed the creative process, the creative mind, and decided that they weren't just crazy the way a lot of people think they actually is a method to creativity. Um, and in fact, it spreads across every discipline, whether you're a physicist or a mathematician or, a, you know, an inventor or a writer or an artist, the creative process has the same steps and the same general pattern. So if you can understand the process, then you aren't nearly as neurotic as you are if you don't understand it. You know, my, one of my goals was to not be crazy. Um, Salvador, Salvador Dali said one of my favorite things about this. He said, the difference between myself and a madman is that I am not mad. And, and I love that because it's, it's exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's understanding the method in your madness, as Shakespeare put it. And if you can understand that, then you don't have to be um, unhappy and neurotic in order to be a productive writer. Speaking of which, writing things down, do you make lists? I do make lists, um, but kind of limited. I mean, what I, what I have instead is a very complicated method of time management that involves a chart that I make uh, regularly. And it, the chart has room for some lists, but most of what I do is doing the same things in compartments of time that I believe are the right compartments for what I do. I know in our last interview, which was about a year, a year and a half ago, we talked about um, one of your books and you talked about time management and that, you know, creative people that get things done, they're very aware of time. So then I started to monitor myself. Am I really as aware of time as I should be? Do, do, maybe I'm not a, a, aware enough. And so it became this new thing where you were talking about before that just that most people that are very productive, they know exactly how much time something takes them. And, and I thought that was interesting because I thought I was aware of time. And then when I started listening to that, I realized, no, I'm actually not because I don't know how much time. And I'm, I'm you know, and it ends up where I'm not giving myself enough of it. So can, can someone be too aware of time, though, where it becomes a hindrance? Uh, yeah, I think that's possible in today's world, especially with all the Apple watches and technology devices for keeping track of time. Um, and that's a, a whole separate subject, but it's very connected with creativity because time is all we have. I mean, there, there are two things in life you can manage. One is work and one is time. And work, uh, one of them is infinite and the other one is finite. So without even talking further about it, you think about that and realize that by definition, you cannot manage an infinite thing. 
right? The infinite element can't be managed. But a finite one can. But for some reason along the way as we grow up in, in the world, we think that the wrong one is infinite and we think it's time. And it's not true. The, the only one that time is infinite for is God. Uh, for the rest of us, it's all too finite. But what is infinite is work. Work is completely infinite because good work produces more work. You know, as my son once told me, Dad, you'll never catch up. I was telling him, you know, I really hope I can catch up this weekend. And he goes, you're going to never catch up. And I, he's right, because work is infinite. If it's good work, it generates more work. If it's bad work, it generates more work. So no matter how you look at it, work is infinite. You can't manage work. You, you can only manage time. And you can manage time if you know how to compartmentalize it in a productive way that works with your particular mind. What I mean by that is that uh, I think that the first step in manage, managing time, other than keeping track of your time like you were talking about, uh, I, when I gave classes on that and when I'm consulting with individuals about their time management, I always start by having them make a weekly chart of their time. And you ask people how many hours are there in a week and they don't even know because it just never occurred to them. But there is a finite number of hours in every week and what I want to know first is what do you do with those hours? Exactly how many hours do you spend sleeping, eating, you know, walking? exercising, talking on the phone, texting, emailing, and, uh, and working on the things you're supposed to work on, and doing errands, and doing all the other things that you don't really want to do, but you kind of have to do to be human. So once you know that, the next step is to figure out attention span. Because when I was a professor, I used to have students who would come and say they were failing history and they didn't get it because they're spending six hours a day studying history. And I go, wait a minute, six hours a day? Yeah, because I'm failing in it. I go, well, it's very possible that you're spending too much time, not too little time. Because what happens during those six hours is probably not the most productive way of studying history. And we would rearrange their patterns so that they would actually study history only one hour a day, but do it in an uninterrupted day, way. And, and here's what you do during that hour, etc. And so what we're trying to figure out is what is your attention span for an individual subject? So if we know that this person can pay attention to history for one hour, and after that, you know, her mind starts wandering, then it's a complete waste of time, literally, to spend more than one hour studying history at a time. That's what I call a compartment of time. So if it comes to your writing, how much time can you write being fully focused and not thinking about the outside world, etc.? And that's the compartment that, where your attention span is at its max. Because if you're doing anything where your attention span is not at its max, you are basically wasting your time and your energy. And those, both of those things have a negative kind of depressive effect on your motivation. They're not good. So you really want to figure out your attention span. And then you want to arrange your life in compartments of time that have to do with attention span. Uh, and when it comes to being conscious of time, one of my rules has been from the very first time I started thinking of these things when I was like 19. So I stopped wearing a watch because I realized that the only way I was going to be productive with my kind of interests and activities was if I lived in my own time and did not live in everybody else's time. But everywhere you look, there's a clock on the wall. There's big, big bin on the horizon. There's, you know, television mon monitors with countdowns on them. There's everything out there reminding you of the world's time. And the world's time is not your time. You don't have all the time in the world. You have your own time. So I discovered a method years ago, which is simply the stopwatch method, which is that instead of using clocks, you use a stopwatch. And you tell yourself, for example, I'm going to write for an hour and a half today, no matter what, and I'm going to monitor that on a stopwatch. 
and I will turn the stopwatch on when I'm actually writing. And when I'm not writing, like if the phone rings and I have to take it or the house burned down and I have to deal with that, then I will turn off the stopwatch until that particular interruption is over with and then I'll go back until I get my hour and a half on the stopwatch. And it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're doing it 3 p.m. or 3 a.m. or 8 p.m., etc. As long as you get that hour and a half on the stopwatch, you are, uh, you know, you're in good shape. So sometimes I have three or four stopwatches around depending on what project I'm applying them to. And of course I've got my computer stopwatch and I rarely look at the time except if there's an appointment or something that I have to be aware of because I'm really focused on, you know, my time, which is the stopwatch's time. And that's what I need to be focused on if I want to, you know, be in that unique category of people who create things and in my case, manage people, create things.